Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Curran. I'm a sustainability policy analyst here with the county. Um, thank you for coming. Welcome to the first of our two trainings today. Um, this is just a small piece of a lot of the very exciting initiatives that are taking place uh, in Albany County. Um, we're happy to have representation from a lot of different municipalities here. So we're hoping to move forward in, in a kind of collaborative effort and, um, you know, create greener and more sustainable communities in and around the county and around the state. Um, so with that, I will hand it off to Jen and uh, from NYSERDA and kick it off. And once again, thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, so I am Jen Manier with NYSERDA. I lead our clean energy siting team. Our role on the clean energy siting team, if you're not familiar with us, is to assist local governments all across the state, cities, towns, villages, counties. We'll also work with organizations that work with them, IDAs, for example. Um, there, there really are no limits there. Our main focus is local governments, though, and our job is to help you all prepare for renewable energy development, clean energy development uh, across the state. So there are you know, lots of new solar projects and energy storage projects and wind projects happening among other things. And a lot of folks are not familiar with the technologies, you know, how they're permitted, all of these things. So our job is to sort of demystify them, provide education, technical assistance, resources, uh, all of the above. So that's our job. Well, we're a small but mighty team. And part of the assistance that we provide are these educational sessions, which as a bonus, also give credit to the county for hosting and the Clean Energy Communities Program. I'm hoping most of you are familiar with that. If not, we can go into that, um, you know, perhaps during Q&A a little bit. But today, uh, one of the, the five courses that we offer, Clean Energy and Your Comprehensive Plan, is what we're going to be doing today. If you stick around for the afternoon, we have some PV permitting and inspecting. That one gets to be a bit more technical. Uh, generally designed for code officials, but if you're just in generally interested in that, I think, you know, it might be good to, uh, to stick around for that one as well. And everything that I'm going to be covering today is also included in a written resource that's available on our website. And those links will all be in the slides and we're happy to share the slides after as well. So I think Given the small group today, it would be helpful for me if we could take a little bit of time and just have each person take maybe, you know, 30, 60 seconds and let me know who you are, uh, what your position is and what municipality you're coming from, if that would be all right. I don't know if we'll be able to unmute the folks on the Zoom or not, uh, but in the meantime, maybe we could start in this room if you all don't mind. Yeah, that'd be great. I can also share this one. Yeah, we'll just we'll just pass this mic around. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm Charles Petroselli. I'm the mayor of the city of Waterville. I'm Barbara Diamond. I'm in the city council in Waterville. Um, I'm Ellie. I'm a code official from the town of Bethlehem. Craig Geyser, uh, code official from the town of Bethlehem. And uh, Justin Harbinger, uh, building inspector for the town of Bethlehem. I have that same coffee mug I was drinking out of it this morning. I'm Grace Sexton. I'm a college student. Uh, Tara Donatio. I work for the Capital District Regional Planning Commission. I'm the uh, Clean Energy Communities Coordinator for the Capital Region. Uh, are we able to get the folks on Zoom to introduce themselves? Meg Grenier, Mayor Village of Manant. Polumi Sen, Senior Project Manager of the City of Albany. Jason Symington, Assistant Facilities Director, Ravina Cleveland Selkirk School. Anyone else? I heard a few. Well, anyway, that's helpful. Thank you. Sorry, sort of uh, winging it here on that one. So our agenda for today, uh, already sort of doing the introductions and I'll go into a little bit more about my team on the next slide as well, in addition to what I already told you on the first slide. Uh, but we're gonna do 
uh, some overviews, uh, just describing clean energy in general. Again, I, ne I never know what level of familiarity folks have, so I like to do just a high level intro to some of the more prominent technologies that might be of interest to you, generally speaking, solar, wind, energy storage now, not that we're limited to that, uh, but just to set a baseline and get everyone on the same page. And then we'll also do just sort of a high level overview of comprehensive planning. Uh, those of you who may be experts in this, uh, feel free to jump in and add to whatever I'm saying. I have no qualms with that. And then finally, we'll go into a bit more detail about how clean energy and your comprehensive plan and how to incorporate it and what that might look like. And then finally, at the end, uh, we'll have a few slides just with additional resources that are out there to help with your planning needs. Again, so like I said, Jen Manier, Clean Energy Siting Team at NYSERDA, we're really, we sort of function like free consultants that are employed by NYSERDA for the state. So feel free to call us up, email us anytime. We're happy to get in the car if we need to and, and drive across the state. You're all in Albany County. So for me, it wouldn't be very far at all, but we're always happy to go out and meet in person, hop on the phone, hop on a Zoom call, whatever it may be. Uh, if you have, you know, you're drafting a zoning ordinance or something and you want a little bit of input on it, you're more, more than happy to review and provide our input. Of course, it's always take it or leave it. We have no authority to tell anyone what to do. We're just here to help as you see fit. Our advice is, again, take it or leave it. Uh, up on the screen there, you'll see the four different guidebooks that our team produces and uh, tries to maintain and keep up to date. So we have a New York State Solar Guidebook for local governments in that guidebook, uh, in addition to many other things, is our model zoning ordinance. It's also available for downloading in Word format, so you can take that and edit it as you see fit. It's just a nice starting point, so if you don't have a zoning ordinance for solar already, uh, you maybe don't have to pay a lawyer as much to start from scratch drafting it and then edit it as you see fit. And again, we're always happy to review and you know walk you through it and provide advice. Uh, we also have, similar to the solar guidebook, a New York energy storage guidebook that also includes a model zoning ordinance for energy storage. Uh, among other things, there's also a copy of the state fire code for energy storage in that guidebook. I know sometimes it's tough for folks to access official copies of the fire code. So we went ahead and just pulled out the energy storage chapter and put it in there because that seems to be the, the biggest concern with energy storage. And we wanted people to be able to have that at their fingertips. Uh, we also have a wind energy guidebook. We do not have a model ordinance for wind yet. We are working on it, but there's tons of other great information about how to prepare for wind development in your community. If that's a thing, it tends to be in the slightly more rural and windy areas, but nonetheless, it exists. And then finally, like I said, the information that we're going over today is also available in a printed resource, which is clean energy and your comprehensive plan. It's our, the newest addition to our guidebook family. Uh, this, that guidebook and this presentation in particular, we've only had around for maybe a couple years now, so relatively new because we got so many incoming questions about how do we go about updating our comprehensive plan. We want to, you know, adopt a solar zoning ordinance, but none of that is talked about in the comp plan, or maybe we don't even have one yet. What do we do? Do you have any model language we could use? And the answer was always. Uh, sorry, we don't, but you know, here's another community that did one that maybe you can look at. So we did our best to pull together a resource. Um, like I said, I have no qualms with folks jumping in if there's something you want to add or know more about. And that's also the case for even our, our resources as they're printed now. If you notice that something is missing in one of them that you'd like to see, please tell us. Uh, we're happy to add new chapters. We want to be adding new chapters and keeping information up to date. If there's some type of resource that you think would be useful that we don't have, uh, let me know. We are not experts in any one of these things on my team. Uh, as you can imagine, like we're looking at uh, four different, you know, three different technologies and like planning processes. So we tend to be a little bit of jack of all trades, uh, master a little bit of some maybe, uh, but not you know, not total experts in everything. So we always look to other folks to help us learn as well too. So, and on the side, we got a link to the Clean Energy Communities Program. Uh, Tara might say a few words about that later too. And then all of these resources, the link on the bottom there to the Clean Energy Siting Team, that's my team. You can download all of those things. We also have some videos of past uh, presentations we've done 
not this one in particular, but there are, there are some other recorded presentations and educational sessions on there. In particular, if you're interested in energy storage, uh, a year or two ago, we did a really in-depth series of webinar series on energy storage, like digging super deep into some of the fire safety topics of concern and things like that. And all of those videos are posted on the website. So encourage checking those out if you haven't. Uh, we even had a Nobel laureate present on one of them. So we had a lot of good guest speakers on there that know way more about the topics than, than we do, which is great. And please feel free to interrupt me with questions throughout. I really don't mind. Uh, so don't be shy. And that goes for the folks on the Zoom call as well. If you raise a hand or something, I assume we'll see it. So high level overview clean energy in New York State, just to set a baseline of understanding for us all, what do we even mean when we say clean energy? Uh, some might just think that means renewables, you know, solar, wind, et cetera, but it really means everything that helps us reduce our emissions, right? So renewables are, of course, included in clean energy, zero emissions electricity generation, right? Uh, but it also includes things like energy efficiency measures that you might take to reduce energy use overall. It also includes clean transportation, all of the above. So clean energy is this really all encompassing term uh, of which renewable energy is a part. So that's what we mean uh, when, we're, when we're referring to clean energy. Right, so some examples, pardon me as I reference my notes here, <laughs> I don't wanna forget anything. Examples of uh, renewable energy, like I said, solar wind, but also hydroelectric, geothermal, tidal and wave energy also included in renewables, uh, examples of related technologies that fall under that larger clean energy umbrella, battery energy storage, green hydrogen is something we're starting to look into and explore uh, a lot more, not super prominent yet, but certainly on the horizon, fuel cell technologies, like I said, energy efficiency and conservation measures, EVs and the charging infrastructure that goes along with those electric vehicles and of course clean heating and cooling technologies that might go in your buildings like heat pumps things like this all of the above so a little bit of background on why you're seeing all of this happen of course we're trying to combat and mitigate climate change which is an issue so that that goes without saying but back in 2019 the state signed into law the uh Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, also known as the CLCPA, also known as the Climate Act. <laughs> it's a mouthful otherwise. And it set some really ambitious goals for the state. Uh, electricity sector goals, we need to have 70% renewable electricity by 2030 and a 100% emissions-free grid by the year 2040. Now, these were goals of ours even prior to the act, but that just codified them into law. So uh, now we don't just want to do our jobs, we have to do our jobs, I guess. <laughs> uh, within that, there are also some technology specific goals, 10,000 megawatts of distributed solar by 2030, 2025. And when I say distributed solar, I'm talking about everything that's not those big utility scale projects. So five megawatts and under all the way down to like the residential level is what we'd referred to as distributed solar. And just for some scale, a five megawatt solar project might be take up, taking up like 25 to 30 acres. So anything smaller than that, distributed solar. Uh, so 10,000 megawatts of that by the year 2025. The original goal was 6,000 megawatts and we're already well on our way. So we went ahead and upped it to 10,000 somewhat recently. That's why there's an, an asterisk on there. Uh, also, we're looking to get 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by the year 2035. Uh, we've had some pretty big offshore wind solicitations recently. So it looks like we're well on our way to that as well. Less of a concern, I think, in Albany County, minus the fact that we might be participating in the supply chain for some of those wind farms here. Uh, so that's cool, lots of jobs to be created. And then finally, energy storage, 1500 megawatts by 2025. And I think most of those megawatts are already contracted and in the pipeline, I think we're somewhere in the neighborhood of like 1300 plus megawatts of energy storage projects awarded currently and 3000 megawatts by the year 2030. 
You'll notice there's another asterisk up there by the energy storage goal because uh, that goal was recently upped. It's not super official yet, but the energy storage roadmap, the state's energy storage roadmap uh, was put out at the end of December and the governor actually just announced in her state of the state address, she sort of gave a nod to it, increasing those energy storage goals from 3000 megawatts to 6000 megawatts. Now that roadmap has to go undergo a little bit of a public comment period. So technically things could change a little, but I highly doubt that that overall goal is gonna change. So for all intents and purposes, 6,000 megawatts of energy storage by 2030 is gonna be the new goal. Uh, the, the image that you see on the bottom of the screen there is a representation of the state's electricity energy source mix. It goes from 1980 to 2017. Uh, we do have an updated version of 28 from 2018, it doesn't look a whole lot different from this, so no reason to update that. Uh, but the reason I show it is because it just shows how much work we have to do and why these goals are important to reach. If you look at the, the thick band, like the dark orange color going across the screen, that is nuclear energy. And again, it, this graph ends in the year 2017. And in 2021, I believe Indian Point, the nuclear generating facility down by the city came offline. And that was two gigawatts of, of power coming out of that station. So that's no longer there. So once we get this updated for to show the year 2021, which probably won't be for a couple of years, the data tends to trial a little bit, but that thick orange line will be much smaller and we're gonna need to make it up somewhere else, right? So that's where these goals come into play. And I think you could say similar things about natural gas, which is the light purple line going across. So we expect those to be shrinking in the coming years and renewables, the, the green line that's going across the middle there to get much, much bigger, right? It needs to be 70% of that graph essentially by the year 2030. And over the years, it looks like that green line hasn't changed a whole lot. And that's because we have a nice solid base of hydropower in New York State and have for a long time, but it's going to get a lot thicker in the coming years if we if we do our jobs, which I think we will. <laughs> All right, so as promised, going to give a little bit of an overview just on the technologies themselves to make sure everyone's on the same page. And just to clarify, when we talk about solar, I think most folks are imagining solar panels, right? Uh, you've seen them on people's houses, maybe you've seen them out in a field in the country somewhere, uh, but that's not the only type of solar. So it's the, it's the type you're most likely to see here, but it's, it's also good to be familiar with the other types of solar generation that's across the country. You might you know read about it in a news article or something and wonder what it is. So solar photovoltaics are the panels that we're all familiar with, uh, but there's also something called concentrated solar power. And what that is, it's essentially parabolic troughs that are like mirrors, parabolic mirrors that will take the sunlight and then all direct it, all these different mirrors direct the, reflect the sunlight back into a common point and use it to heat up a liquid to generate electricity via spinning a turbine. You're probably not gonna see that in New York ever, if I were to guess, but there are some examples of it like out in the middle of the deserts, out west, et cetera. Um, one of, one of the things folks uh, will raise concerns about solar, they'll be like, oh, I heard solar's, you know, killing birds and it's too hot and it's frying them or whatever. That is something that has happened with the concentrated solar power, those, you know, those beams of concentrated solar power going in to heat up that liquid can be not great. A bird flies through it, but again, not something you're going to see here. So again, that's sort of part of my team's job too, is to take some of the myths or misinformation that are out there and, and clarify them a little bit. And then uh, lastly, there's also solar thermal. Uh, you might see a little bit of that in New York actually. And essentially that's just uh, having like dark tubes of some sort of liquid, probably on the side or roof of a building, just absorbing radiation from the sunlight and using it to heat water or some other liquid to, to bring heating into the home. So solar thermal, fairly self-explanatory. Uh, but we're gonna be talking about solar photovoltaics for the most part going forward. 
And within that, there are a few different types of solar PV installations. So we have residential and commercial or even like smaller commercial. Things that are typically attached to buildings are located on the same property of that building, right? And we think of those as being behind the meter. They're typically, like I said, rooftop mounted or ground mounted. And the reason we refer to them as behind the meter is because in most instances, they are physically behind the meter that is serving whatever that building is, either a home or a business, what have you. And it just reduces the amount of electricity that that building is pulling from the grid, right? So the meter doesn't really know the difference behind the meter. Um, I'm going to skip over the community solar for one second and move on to the utility scale, which we would refer to as front of the meter. Again, literally located in front of the meter, not associated with any particular building. These are those larger utility scale projects that you're likely to see out in a more rural area where there is space to build them. And they just feed power into the grid like any other large power plant would. Again, not tied to any specific building, participating in the wholesale electricity market. Now, skipping back up to community solar, which you see between the commercial and utility scale there, uh, it's this funny middle ground where community solar sort of functions as if it's behind the meter, but it's actually physically located in front of the meter, just like those utility scale projects would be. So community solar is, they're typically five megawatts and under. So that's a, a natural cutoff that I mentioned before. So think 25, 30 acres of panels. So they're typically somewhere between two and five megawatts. And it's essentially that residential homes and small businesses can subscribe to a portion of that project and have their portion of the electricity generated from the community solar project taken off their bill. So again, it functions as if it's you know, panels that they might've had on the roof or something as far as the billing and crediting and, and things like that go, but the physical project is located offsite somewhere. So that's why community solar is this, this funny middle ground there. Functions is behind the meter, has specific off takers or buildings tied to it. It knows who's benefiting from that power, but it's located offsite. So th those are nice high level overview of the different types of PV installations. And then for scale, uh, ground mounted solar, taking up somewhere between five to seven acres per megawatt. That's why I was saying five megawatt project, probably 25, 30, maybe 35 acres. And for a little bit more context, uh, one megawatt can power somewhere between one to 200 homes, of course, depending on the size of the home. I would say in the future, we might be updating these slides to not just have a homes comparison as we start to electrify more and more things like electric vehicles. We might, you know, add a little bullet that says, here's how many, you know, vehicles you can charge at once with one megawatt of power or something like that. But just for a little context. All right, wind energy, uh, three basic system components on a typical wind tower. You have the rotor, uh, which is number one, that includes the blades there. Uh, the nacelle, number two, right here. I don't know how well you guys can see this stuff. Uh, that's where the actual generator is located, right? As the turbine spins, it's generating electricity there. And then of course the tower that holds it all up where the wind is and can bring the power back down and dump it onto the grid. Uh, so nothing too mysterious there. Uh, some of the characteristics of wind is we're seeing increased turbine capacities and increased turbine sizes as time goes on and they get more efficient. Uh, this is another slide that we'll probably be updating soon. A typical turbine that you might see installed if you drive out particularly into central and western New York and see some of those old wind farms that are there, two to three megawatts perhaps per tower. They're getting a lot bigger more recently. I think a lot of the newer projects that would be going in are probably more like five megawatts per turbine. So they're, get, they're getting larger and not just taller, but the diameters of, of the blades are also getting bigger too. So they can just capture more energy. Uh, they generate, as you can tell, a lot more energy per acre, right, than solar does. One megawatt of solar taking up five to seven acres versus you can have five megawatts in one turbine on a very small piece of land. 
Of course, you can't cram them together or they won't work as well, but still. Um, and one important thing to note as well is onshore wind turbines tend to be a bit smaller than the offshore wind turbines. Uh, there's a lot more wind out in the uh, over the water and you can put them farther away from folks so they can be bigger, right? So onshore tend to be a little bit smaller, even though the onshore ones are getting larger and larger as time goes on. All right, energy storage. Uh, I don't, I don't think we've done an energy storage training for Albany County yet, but that's another one that we could do in the future. Uh, do you know if we have? I don't think so. No. So, all right, quick intro into energy storage. So, with all all of these resources that we've talked about so far, intermittent renewables, right? The sun's not always shining, the wind is not always blowing, but we always need electricity. So, that's one of the one of the many ways that energy storage can come in and benefit the grid, right? It can take solar power when it's being generated, but it's too much for us to use and store it for later use. The same is true for when the wind is blowing, but creating more energy than we can use locally. You can store it in a battery and then push it the energy back into the grid when we do need it. So that's the, the super simple explanation of why we're gonna see a lot more energy storage starting to, to be installed. Similarly to solar, there are a few different installation types of battery energy storage, residential and commercial, which we would refer to again as behind the meter, again, because they're physically located behind the meter tied to a specific building or use or home. Um, in that case, they're typically used as a backup power, I would think would be the most common scenario if someone has energy storage in their home. So the power goes out, they might have, you know, 48, four to eight hours of, like in place of a generator of energy storage. Um, for a commercial building, they could use energy storage as backup emergency power, similarly to a home, but there are also large commercial establishments or uh, that have high demand charges, right? So if they're pulling a ton of power from the grid at their peak usage of whatever they're doing, think like an industrial process maybe. Uh, the way that their charges work is that they'll be charged a fee for the, the most amount of power that they're ever gonna pull, right? So they can actually lower their electricity bills by shaving off their peak energy usage by using a battery on site to provide some of their power during the times when they need the most energy so that the grid doesn't have to feed them quite as much and they can lower those demand charges. So it's not just backup power, there are other uses for energy storage as well, both on site and on the grid itself. Like I said, you know, capturing the energy from solar and wind uh, when we don't need it and pushing it back out when we do need it. There are lots of other benefits to energy storage, which uh, we don't have time to go into all of the nitty gritty details during this. Again, just trying to do a high level overview, uh, but we already went through the backup power and energy arbitrage, but they can also just provide great services for the grid in general and help it function properly and smoothly. And there are spots on the grid where there'll be a lot of congestion, right? tons of power being generated coming into one spot and the lines can't really handle it. So in places like that, if you strategically place energy storage systems, they can sort of pull off some of that excess and then put it back in when it's needed so that the grid can handle the flow of electricity. Again, not, not uh, and there's like a ton of other little ancillary services that energy storage can provide to the grid, uh, like frequency regulation and things like that, that I am not, uh, an expert in, we'd have to get one of the energy storage engineers in the room to go into all of those details, but just know that there are lots of great grid services that these systems can provide. And in the, in the end, save money because you don't have to spend as much upgrading the grid to handle all of this stuff. If you can have energy storage just plugged in and not have to worry about building new lines or replacing them or expanding them, et cetera. Uh, and when it comes to the utility scale, energy storage systems. They can be located a couple of different ways. They might be located directly on site with a large scale solar project or with a wind project. You might see the energy storage right there with it, but they can also be 
located just on their own, a standalone battery energy storage system somewhere on the grid, wherever it's needed, sort of like I was describing a little bit ago. So all different sort of use cases for them. So we'll see a lot more of that coming up too. All right, so all of these technologies that we've talked about so far have some land use considerations and other considerations that, that localities and municipalities might you know, have concerns about. So all of them, you'll want to make sure that they're in an appropriate location for your community and that there's zoning in place to handle them so that you're able to sort of direct where they go and think about that ahead of time. They all have different environmental impacts to be considered, right? Uh, you need to consider bulk and area standards for how you want them designed and built. All of these systems uh, have decommissioning considerations. What happens to them at the end of their useful life? How do you plan for that? What does that look like? Are they gonna be recycled? Or are they gonna be repowered, et cetera? Who's responsible for that? Who's responsible for paying for that? Uh, taxation is another big one. <laughs> If you've been following some of our work with the Department of Tax and Finance over the last couple of years, you will maybe be familiar with the standardized assessment methodology that was put out, which is basically intended to help local government, uh, local assessors figure out how to assess property taxes for those larger scale solar and wind projects, anything greater than one megawatt. Uh, there's been a little bit of litigation going on in, at the moment, so it's not required at this point, but the whole point of that was to, to make sure that assessors across the state could easily figure out how to handle property taxes for some of those larger systems that they might not be familiar with. And the reason it's, it's tricky is because unlike a, a home where you can look at sales records and just compare sell selling prices for things to determine a value for it. These projects aren't getting bought and sold all the time like homes on the real estate market would be. And also looking at just the cost to build them is also not necessarily indicative of their value. The real value in the projects that are generating electricity is in how much money they can make selling said electricity. So that model, was designed to be a discounted cash flow model and assessing those systems based on you know how much money someone would be able to make off of them. Again, some litigation going on uh, if you haven't been following it, but interesting. Nonetheless, uh, yeah, so all of those technologies have those sorts of considerations, but they also have some unique considerations as well. Solar in particular has visual and aesthetic impacts, fairly straightforward and obvious. When you look at it, you see it. Uh, some people do not want to look at it and see it, particularly for the larger projects that might be out in the country. Uh, if a neighbor believes that you know they have a scenic vista when they look out their kitchen window, they're looking at fields and trees, and now the neighbor decided to lease their land for a large solar project, the neighbor next door might not be too happy about that. So that's something to consider when we're looking at zoning and siting for these projects. And then of course, solar would also have agricultural land impacts, the same land that is great for farming, clear, flat, open, relatively flat anyway, doesn't have to be totally flat, is also good for installing solar projects, very easy to do it there. So we need to make sure we're balancing preserving agricultural land with also meeting our renewable energy goals and you know fighting climate change, et cetera. So agricultural land impacts are a, a huge, huge consideration uh, for solar. Uh, every day in the newspaper, I'd say there's something about some project somewhere and it's conflicting with ag land. So we try to address that as well. Uh, wind, also visual and aesthetic impacts. They're very different from solar. Like I said, you know, each one takes up less acreage. It's much easier and straightforward to continue farming around each turbine, should you so choose, but they're taller. You can see them from a farther distance. So they have different visual and aesthetic impacts than a solar project would. Uh, wind projects also can generate noise. Uh, it can be modeled and you know where the noise is gonna land and at what level, but you need to make sure if a project's gonna come in that the zoning addresses noise considerations. You know, As it turns, it can make sort of a thumping sound as the blade goes by the tower each time. 
and you don't want to be annoying neighbors again, you know, staying in their kitchen with thumping sounds. So very important to consider all of that before a project's built. And wind turbines also have a unique consideration in the form of shadow flicker. So if a turbine's spinning and the sun's behind it, you can imagine it could cast some pretty annoying shadows depending on how it's sighted, where it's landing and where the neighbor's homes are, right? So unique considerations for wind there. Energy storage, unique considerations. Uh, number one, fire safety. Uh, it's a lot of power and energy stored in a very small space. As you can imagine, when that happens, there is more potential for fires to occur among other incidences. Uh, ex explosions are a concern. So that's one of the reasons I mentioned earlier in our energy storage guidebook, we include a copy of the state fire code. I think what's really great about that is it's, it's one of the most stringent fire codes in the country for energy storage. Uh, it used to be that it was, you know, maybe a page or like a few paragraphs or so in the old fire state fire code addressing energy storage. When it was written, it absolutely did not anticipate the level of energy storage that we need to see to meet our goals. And we started seeing reports, you know, in other states, particularly in other countries of safety incidents happening with energy storage, you know, either catching on fire in some cases, uh, exploding and we did not want to see that happen in New York State so we worked with our friends at Department of State got an emergency rule passed and adopted what is now an entire chapter dedicated to energy storage many many pages lots and lots of safety precautions built into it so we feel very good uh, about preventing those types of incidences in New York now but it's still uh, great to educate everyone and make sure they're actually built according to said code to make sure that none of these incidents occur. And then relatedly, incident management training, super, super important. Um, I can think one story in particular, I can think where there was an incident in Arizona. Uh, it resulted in some first responders getting injured when they responded to a scene of an energy storage fire because they had not received one of the reasons was they had not received proper training in how to respond to it. So whenever we have one of the, the larger, in particular, larger energy storage systems going in, one of, one of the recommendations we have in our guidebook for local governments to adopt is requiring that the, the owner, the developer of the system train the local fire department in how to respond to these things. So just a little snapshot of clean energy in New York State, the map on the left, uh, I believe that's a snapshot uh, in 2021. It's just showing the distributed clean energy projects, those large utility scale projects don't show up as dots on this map, although they follow somewhat of a similar pattern, just sort of giving you an idea of where projects are distributed across the state. So this is showing solar PV projects, the distributed solar projects that I mentioned before, which are, you know, on the smaller, excuse me, on the smaller side, uh, combined heat and power projects, anaerobic digester projects, fuel cell projects, and some energy storage projects. They tend to follow along these distribute more distributed ones to like population centers, and also, you know, along power lines and highways, sort of avoiding the Adirondack Park, no surprise really, you know, projects are going where the people are here. Uh, and then on the right hand side, we just have a, a, a slightly updated 2020 graphic showing the energy mix in New York State. Uh, the bottom half in red is fossil fuels. So much like the chart I was showing earlier, that is going to have to shrink a lot in the coming years. And the top is going to get much bigger. All of our zero emissions uh, generators, like a lot of it is actually nuclear. And again, this is 2020, so that yellow is going to be a bit smaller once this is updated to reflect Indian Point coming off. Uh, but just, just another graphic to show how much work we have to do going forward. And our job is to try and help you be prepared for projects that are coming into your municipality. All right, so a little bit about uh, regulating and permitting clean energy in general in the state. Uh, we're change it uh, next slide for folks on Zoom. Yeah, uh, it's gonna vary depending on the size of the project. 
and the type of installation that you're doing, like the technology. So for solar and wind projects, anything less than 25 megawatts is going to be permitted at the local level through you know, the state environmental quality review procedures seeker and any municipal requirements you might have. So your, your own zoning regulations, et cetera. So under 25 megawatts permitted locally, projects that are 25 megawatts or larger are gonna be permitted at the state level up until a few years ago, that would have been through the state's Article 10 process, but we recently created, um, it was the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act, I wanna say it was 2020, that created the Office of Renewable Energy Siting to permit these larger solar and, solar and wind projects in the state. Uh, the old Article 10 process was originally designed for permitting fossil fuel power plants, uh, which as you might expect would require a lot more review and customized review. And it would take many, many, many years, I would say on average five, sometimes up to seven years to get a renewable energy project permitted through that old article 10 process. Uh, to meet all of the aforementioned goals, uh, we do not have that kind of time to get renewable projects permitted. So the state created the Office of Renewable Energy Siting, which can permit these projects now. And they have a maximum of one year, essentially, from the time the application is deemed complete to get them permitted. Uh, if the office does not make a decision within that time, uh, it's, autom it's automatically approved. Now, there's this weird middle ground uh, for projects between 20 and 25 megawatts. I couldn't tell you exactly why this, this caveat is in there, but between 20 and 25 megawatts, the developer has the option to either go through the local permitting process or submit an application to ORES, the Office of Renewable Energy Siting. So funny middle ground. Otherwise, generally smaller, permitted locally, larger, permitted through the Office of Renewable Energy Siting, formally permitted through the Article 10 process, which took much longer. Um, like I said, ORIS has a max of one year to permit projects, but there is one, one interesting caveat in there too. If it's a project that's located on a brownfield or some other sort of underutilized or previously used property like a brownfield, uh, they can be permitted much faster in as little as six months. So that's cool, that makes sense. Usually those projects tend to be a lot less controversial anyway. So faster permitting time makes sense there. Uh, so that's for solar and wind. Uh, for energy storage, it's a little different. If energy storage is paired with or co-located with one of those solar wind projects, like I said before, um, they're not always co-located, but they can be. So if you have energy storage as part of one of them, it will also be permitted through ORES, the Office of Renewable Energy Siting, along with the solar or wind project that's, that's going through the process. Uh, regardless of the size of the energy storage system. Any energy storage systems, again, regardless of the size that is not co-located with a generator like solar or wind is gonna be permitted locally. So those, those size cutoffs that you see at the top for solar and wind of 25 megawatts that determines whether it's local or state, uh, doesn't apply to energy storage. You could have an energy storage system that's 30 megawatts and it's still gonna be permitted at the local level. Could that change in the future? Sure, but that's how it is uh, right now. All right, so now brief overview into comprehensive planning in New York State. Uh, like I said before, we are not the end all be all or experts in this. I'm gonna probably a few times throughout this presentation, tee up our friends over at Department of State and their Division of Local Government Services. They have much more in-depth trainings on comprehensive planning in general. Uh, they're, they're the experts there. Uh, again, we just have to know sort of a little bit about everything in, when we're working in renewables. So I'm gonna give brief overview comprehensive planning in New York State, at least in my best here. So defining the comprehensive plan, a super fun slide, right? I got a copy of a definition up here. And this definition is pulled from the New York State zoning enabling statutes um, as amended in 1993. Prior to that, we didn't have a definition of what a comprehensive plan was. 
And what this is saying is communities are enabled to adopt a comprehensive plan and sort of lay out what they want and how they envision their community be, but they're they're not required to. And there's also nothing dictating with what frequency said plan needs to be updated either. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and read it real quick. So it's hard to read things and listen at the same time. So we'll just do that. So defining the comprehensive plan, it's materials written and or graphic, including but not limited to maps, charts, studies, resolutions, reports and other descriptive material that identify the goals, objectives, principles, guidelines, policies, standards, devices and instruments for both the immediate and long range protection enhancement growth and development of the municipality. Now, trying to simplify that down a little bit, what's really in a comprehensive plan, you have descriptive material, and it, it's really important that that material in the plan describes and captures the character of the local jurisdiction. It also needs to include the goals, objectives, principles, guidelines, policies, standards, devices, and instruments to do so. So, and the scope of that comp plan should reflect that of the governing municipality. As, as you can imagine with all these words, uh, reflecting the comp plan, it's uh, complex, it's multifaceted, it's doing a lot of things. It's also both immediate and long range. Uh, it should not only look to what you want your community to be, but also what it was and uh, like what's to come and what it is. So it's, it's looking at the past, present and future, what your community was, what it is now and what you want it to be going forward. So comprehensive, right? Uh, it should be designed to pr for protection, enhancement, growth and development in the community. And recognize, we recognize that some of these goals are potentially or perhaps even inherently at odds with one another. So balance and consideration is obviously of the utmost importance when trying to do one of these. Um, yeah. All right, so the what, the how, and the why of comp planning in New York State. The what, again, it's what the community looks like now and what it's envisioned to look like in the future. It should also include the how, how you plan to get to that future state. And the why, also very important. Why the plans that you're making or that future that you're describing is either worth protecting uh, or pursuing or preserving, sorry. Uh, and it's particularly important because as it relates to zoning, as a comp plan relates to zoning, all land use regulations must be in accordance with a comprehensive plan. And that language is captured in, you know, village law, town law, city law, et cetera. So you can't just go, um, or it would be risky anyway, to go and just adopt a solar zoning ordinance without having any mention of solar in your comp plan or anything to sort of back up why you have said ordinance. So having an up-to-date comprehensive plan on the books that reflects what you want and all of the zoning that aligns with it can protect your municipality from uh, lawsuits, for example. If you adopt a zoning ordinance that conflicts with the comp plan, the comp plan is going to sort of take precedent precedence in, in any suit like that. So it's important that it's up to date and in line with um, any of the land use regulations that you end up adopting, which is why we got so many questions over it over the years, because we had a model zoning ordinance, but we did not have any comprehensive planning guidance. So here we are. Uh, so that's the first bullet on this. Why is the comprehensive plan important? Sort of what I was covering on the last slide. It's imperative uh, to, for making sure that your zoning and land use regulations have something to back them up, why you adopted said regulation, right? Uh, it can also be important for consideration by other agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, county, county entities when considering grant funding and things like that. They wanna see that your community has put some thought into whatever you know action you're saying you want to take or want assistance with. It can just set you up for success when working with other entities. Um, it can, more importantly, uh, help ensure that your planning is responsive to development or is not just responsive to development, right? You're planning ahead of time. Uh, nobody wants to have a large 
project, come into their town, and they've never thought about what that would mean for them before or how they would want to handle it. Not a great position to be in to be scrambling at the last minute to try to prepare for, for example, a large solar project. You maybe don't understand the technology or how the permitting works or anything like that. Uh, so it's good to be proactive and going through a comprehensive planning effort is one way to do that. It also encourages communication and transparency throughout the community so that everyone uh, at least has the option to be on board with what the community wants and what you're planning to do, how you want your community to look in the future. Sorry, just doing a time check here, one hour in. Uh, yep, so it, it's also a great way to document the community's past, present, and future. That's sort of a common theme here. What were we, what are we, what do we wanna be? And plenty of other reasons as well. All right, so key considerations for comprehensive planning. Uh, there's a lot of documenting, studying, and understanding the existing conditions, sort of a first step there. It's obviously super important to obtain community input and make sure you're hearing voices from lots of different folks across the community, residents, business owners, uh, perhaps even you know, developers and folks that wanna come into the town, what their opinion would be interesting to get as well if you can do that, and it should, it should adhere to a consistent process and structure so that it's easy to follow. So identifying clear goals, uh, selecting and defining objectives and strategies uh, in pursuit of those goals, and then developing super detailed, clear implementation plans for achieving those objectives and strategies in support of those goals, right? Another consideration is funding. Uh, funding that could perhaps come out of the comprehensive plan, like we were mentioning before, it, you know, state, federal, county agencies might be looking at it, but also it's important to consider how you're going to fund the development of the plan itself. Do you have in-house staff? Do you need to hire someone, et cetera? Uh, one important note, uh, through the consolidated funding application, our friends over at Department of State, they have offered comprehensive planning grants in the past. I can't recall if they have some available right now or will in the next round of the CFA, but speaking of the funding, important to note that Department of State does offer planning grants, at least they have. Uh, so th this photo is always fun. Um, I've been asked in the past if these were pictures that I took and if so, which communities were they at? And honestly, I don't recall, I don't know where they came from. One of, one of my colleagues put this slide together. I think he found random photos of meetings that were just illustrative. So we're not calling out any particular towns here. They're just meant to be illustrative. So comprehensive planning should absolutely be a proactive versus a reactive exercise. Uh, typically, when you're being proactive, I would think in most local governments anyway, your meeting rooms, they tend to kind of look like the one on the left. People aren't super interested in coming out if there's not anything controversial yet. Uh, but then after a project comes in that folks may not like, the meeting room tends to look like the photo on the right. Uh, what we want to do is swap them out and and do your best to make sure that the proactive planning and you know get people involved in the planning early. You want you want your meetings to look like the one on the right before something is controversial in the town or city or village. Okay, so like I said a few times throughout, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pushing uh, the resources and support that's offered by our friends at Department of State. So got to throw this slide in there. Uh, they have a local government training schedule on their site. They can go into much more detail with all of this. They are the experts when it comes to the planning and zoning. Uh, they also have a zoning and the comprehensive plan resource, a written resource available on their website, and also a recording of a training for comprehensive planning as well. And those are, those are all hyperlinks if we distribute these slides after, so you can find them there. All right, so finally getting into the meat of it. And again, does, before I do that, does anyone have questions or thoughts, anecdotes that you'd like to offer up that you think would be helpful to others? Don't be shy. I welcome it. It'll give me uh, more interesting, you know, things to add for future presentations. So please, please jump in at any point. All right, so get anyway, getting into the meat of it, 
incorporating clean energy into your comprehensive plan now that we've covered all the basics of the technologies and comp planning in general. I'm going to try to get you through uh, clean energy and at the end even give you some super specific examples of actual language that you might be able to include in your plan. Um, I'm hopeful that in the future we can expand all of the example language that we have. Uh, right now it's not a ton, but it's a good starting point. All right, so why do we wanna plan for clean energy? Well, first of all, it's in the name. Comprehensive plans should include everything, including clean energy, which is something we're all dealing with uh, for now, uh, for the rest of our lives, right? So it should be included just like any other consideration in your community. And, and again, we'll, we'll keep going back to those New York State enabling statutes that all of your zoning and land use regulations must be in accordance with the comprehensive plan. So if you wanna regulate clean energy, it should be part of the comp plan, right? Uh, there's also benefits to, to including it. Uh, it's a, a tangible, you know, obvious representation of what your community wants, what its policies are, what its priorities are. Uh, it can provide clarity for your municipal boards, decision makers, project developers, before they even come into your town they, or city, they can look at your comp plan and you know, see what they're getting into and if it makes sense for them to try to get into that thing or not. Uh, it can strengthen your position in the event of a legal dispute, which I alluded to earlier. The comp plan is sort of the basis for, for all of the zoning and land use regulations. And again, it can open the door and help you to access grants and other incentives if the folks giving out those grants and incentives can see that you've planned for and are you know prepared to do what you say you're going to do with that money. Uh, I'll go, I did a little bit of the clean energy overview earlier, but I just wanna reiterate what we're talking about when we say clean energy. It's not just renewables, it's not just energy efficiency, it's not just buildings, it's not just electricity generation, it's not just clean transportation, it's all of the above, that's clean energy. So all of the technologies and the programs and initiatives and things like that, that that support it, we sort of wrap into this umbrella of clean energy. So it includes the renewable generating technologies, but it also includes all the, the strategies and concepts that support it too. All right, so this is this is another um, point that will drive home the, the state level permitting process. Folks are always very interested in how that works. Uh, like I mentioned before, there were sort of there's sort of two ways that large scale renewable energy generators have been permitted at the state. Previously, Article 10, there are still a few legacy projects going through the Article 10 process any new project being developed is going through the Office of Renewable Energy Siting, which is that more streamlined approach that takes far less time, one year max. Uh, but regardless of which state process, permitting process a project's going through, even though it's being permitted at the state, it does not mean that the local laws and zoning do not matter. They do. Uh, the default for both of those processes is that any project that comes in should be meeting all of the you know, local requirements that are set forth. And the quote on the right-hand side is language that's included in both Article 10 and ORES. And whenever a project submits an application to them, they need to include a statement as to whether the, the any applicable local jurisdiction, you know, sometimes these projects are located in multiple jurisdictions, if any of them have adopted a comp plan, that's applicable to their facility and whether or not the facility is consistent with that plan. And they have to actually include a copy of that plan in their application for the state permitting. So the default for those, even though ultimate permitting authority rests with the state, the default is these projects should comply with local regulations if those local regulations exist. Uh, if they don't exist, then the default regulations in ORES just, you know, flow through. Well, I guess I thought maybe I had a slide elaborating on that more, but I guess I don't. It's a good time to point out that if the local regulations are deemed unreasonably burdensome by ORES in that, you know, they would essentially block the project from happening. ORES does have the ability to over override the local laws. 
So it's not just important to have a comp plan and zoning on the books. It's also important to make sure that it's somewhat reasonable and not intentionally designed to purposefully block out projects, but to just, you know, be reasonable. Because if it is deemed unreasonably burdensome, uh, it would get overridden by the ORES process anyway. But again, the default is projects comply with local regulations. All right, this one, I'm gonna have to look up here because this is too small for me too and I don't wanna mess up. So uh, select, if selecting a plan format and process. So step one, and this is all, I think, you know, fairly straightforward, obvious stuff, but sometimes it's nice to just have it written down and, and visualize how you go about thinking about it, right? So at the top, does your community have an existing comprehensive plan? Yes or no? If yes, you know, is it recent? Was it adopted less than 10 years ago or has it undergone periodic review? If it was adopted less than 10 years ago or has undergone periodic review, you might just consider amending your existing comp plan to include clean energy goals and objectives. If it's older than 10 years uh, or has not undergone periodic review, you obviously review the existing plan and decide whether you need a new one or an update is appropriate, right? Uh, if your community does not have an existing comp plan, clearly you need to create a new comprehensive plan and you can evaluate your options here. The plan could contain a standalone clean energy component or it could incorporate clean energy goals and objectives sort of sprinkled in throughout your plan. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, while, you're, while you're doing that, you may consider uh, exercising the option to do a land use moratoria for solar or you know whatever technologies it is that you're consider, considering trying to incorporate into the comp plan or adopting zoning for. So what that is, it's a local law or ordinance that suspends, and this is important, for a reasonable time, property owners' rights to obtain development rights for you know whatever it is that you're suspending. A reason to do this is to consider drafting or adopting land use plans uh, to respond to anything that's not adequately dealt with under its current laws. Um, I think some some communities might get a little fuzzy when it comes to to the why there, because I've seen some communities that already have, for example, solar zoning on the books that went through all of the appropriate channels, and then they decide they don't like it anymore and put a moratorium in place to revise it. I'm not a lawyer. Seems a little bit uh, a little bit sketchy to do that because one could argue that it was already adequately dealt with in the existing zoning. So just, you know, always make sure the lawyers are on board with when you're doing a moratorium and what the reasons are and what a reasonable time period would be. I've also seen a lot of communities across the state adopt a solar moratorium. They're like, we need one year to do this, revise our zoning. And then it comes up on the one year, nothing's happened. They do it for another year. And you start to wonder if they're really adopting a moratorium in accordance with the law, or if they're just trying to you know, block development from happening indefinitely by continuing to re-up it. Uh, but anyway, it should be for a reasonable amount of time and it should be to consider land use uh, planning and zoning for issues that are not already adequately dealt with in the current uh, the current rules. Uh, and in order to do that, it requires the local legislature to formally adopt and file a law or ordinance, just like adopting any other law, right? Again, things to consider the reasonableness, uh, the impacts on landowners in your community. Uh, often, actually, I don't think I've seen a moratorium that doesn't do this, they tend to be adopting a moratorium to rethink the regulations around utility scale solar or utility scale wind projects. But in the meantime, you're also preventing homeowners from putting solar on the roof of their own home, uh, which you may or may not want to do. So another consideration, what impact does this have on the larger community, even if the impetus was one project that sort of triggered the need or the want? Uh, should have a specific timeline and scope associated with it. And this is another one of those things where, you know, there is legal standing. There are rules around how and why 
uh, community can adopt a moratorium. So it's important to be careful. And that's what I was sort of alluding to earlier, like, mm, was it really necessary? W were these things not adequately dealt with? Does it make sense to have a moratorium? And also for how long can you keep re-upping it without uh, progress being made? All right, so we are going to just walk through the, the steps to uh, comprehensive planning and incorporating clean energy into your comp plan, right? So step one, adopt a policy resolution or statement, uh, assert the overall goals of the comp planning process regarding clean energy, um, uh, state your intention to consider clean energy development in your municipal plans and regulations, outline any previously identified plan formats and processes that you've used. Are you gonna do a new plan? Is it gonna be a new component in an existing plan? Uh, step two, identify the funding and resources required. This, that could be incorporated into the resolution or statement. Here's where we're gonna get the funding to do this. It doesn't necessarily need to be. Uh, it should, you should consider, are you gonna use in-house municipal staff? Or are you gonna tap your county and regional planning staff, uh, use volunteers, hired consultants? How are you gonna find that? So lastly, identify and apply for grant funding as available you know, if you need it, which I would assume many, many communities probably do not have adequate in-house staff to undertake uh, a large process like this. Uh, step three, uh, identify the body or the individuals that are charged with developing the plan. Another thing that can be incorporated into that resolution or statement doesn't necessarily need to be, but would make it super clear. Uh, it could be that you're charging the local legislature with doing it, maybe the planning board, maybe you create a special board or committee. Uh, obviously important to make sure that any individuals that are gonna be participating in this are educated and up to speed on clean energy programs, goals and technologies. Uh, maybe if you have a volunteer, sending them to, you know, a course like this or some of those Department of State courses would be good to set a baseline for them. Um, oh, that's cut off. I don't know why that's cut off, but uh, determining the existing conditions. There are lots of different existing conditions, considerations uh, before going into the comp planning exercise. Over on the right-hand side of the screen, we gave just some examples of the types of existing condition studies that you might consider undertaking when you're trying to incorporate clean energy. So there are energy and grid considerations, right? You might want to take a look at the hosting capacity maps of the, the grid in your community. And those, they're available online and they essentially show you what the wires in your community, how much electricity can flow through them in certain areas. So if you see certain areas in your community where the lines are pretty much full and tapped out, maybe you're not gonna think too hard about large scale solar projects going there because they wouldn't be able to plug in and, and dump their energy into that part of the grid. Uh, if you see another part of it where there's plenty of room on the lines and lots of open space nearby, you might think long and hard about you know, how you want solar or not to be happening in that place, but at least be prepared to deal with people perhaps wanting to put it there, right? So utility hosting capacity, proximity to grid infrastructure, which I was alluding to, where's the land in relation to where the, the power lines are, especially the, the larger transmission lines, right? That we need in order to plug in those larger projects. Uh, what your municipal energy profile is. We're not just talking large scale renewables here. We're talking all clean energy. So there might be things that you want to do as a municipality to reduce your own energy usage. So looking at your own energy profile, what your buildings are using, how they compare to other buildings, perhaps benchmarking them, things like this, uh, just to get a lay of the land and a good starting point. <laughs> Uh, also agricultural considerations. You might want to research what lands in your community are in certified ag districts or that have ag assessments on them already for property taxes. What the soil types in your community are, what the qualities of those soil types are so you can be prepared and just again, literally have a lay of the land in this case. Uh, there are environmental considerations. Uh, you might want to do some environmental resource assessments as part of it, examining if there are any endangered or sensitive species in town. If you have wetlands, where the wetlands are, so you can pre be prepared to protect them or deal with them adequately uh, with mitigation measures, uh, depending on what kind of projects come in. And of course, socioeconomic considerations, 
might want to examine the existing conditions. Like, do you have disadvantaged communities in your town or, you know, where uh, low to moderate income folks, what percentage are they, where are they located? Are there environmental justice communities? Are there areas in your community where people are living next to uh, like a, a polluting industry, for example? And have they been dealing with that for so many years and we don't want to burden them anymore? Maybe we want them to benefit the most from projects that come into town, for example. All right, so diving a little deeper into one of those example existing condition studies that you might want to consider. I, I talked about it a little, but we're gonna we're gonna visualize it here more. So the map on the right is showing one of the utility hosting capacity maps that you can find online, just kind of zoom into your town and see where the lines are. The red lines tend to have less available capacity on them. As they get more blue, those lines have more available capacity on them. And so again, if you see lines that have lots of capacity and they're overlaid with land that is open and available, you might be thinking about solar projects going there, right? So it's good to get that lay of the land. So identifying the potential locations for solar based on some of this criteria is good to get started, right? So grid proximity, hosting capacity of the lines, what existing zoning is going on around those areas and what land uses are happening, you know, next to those land uses or nearby. And this next slide here kind of shows that in action. Um, one thing that did not show up on the on the previous slide was the transmission lines. They tend to they're they're on different maps. So every utility in the state has to post their hosting capacity maps on the internet, and anyone can access them for free. But it really only shows distribution lines. It does not show the the high capacity transmission lines. But our friends down at Scenic Hudson put together a solar sighting, a solar mapping tool, if you will. And so they got all of the data sets for the distribution lines and the transmission lines, and they overlaid them together in one place. And while most of that solar sighting tool, the layers are only available in the mid Hudson region for many of the layers that they have put on there, like you can overlay ag land, et cetera. Uh, the power lines are available across the whole state. So anyone can use the scenic Hudson solar mapping tool and see all of your distribution lines and the transmission line, which is hot pink here. You'll notice that wasn't in the one before. And those are the lines that you would typically see uh, those larger utility scale projects plugging into, right? So make sure you got all the, all the map layers you're interested in. And then you can overlay, in this case, uh, some local zoning, and then start to identify areas where like, okay, here's an industrial zoned part of town, has a transmission line going through it, has plenty of space. Maybe we want to even encourage large scale solar development in that area because that would be a good fit. Or maybe there's a transmission line going through here, but that's more densely populated. We wanna make sure our zoning says, don't do that there, even if there is room on the line, because it doesn't make sense uh, for a large project to go there. So just sort of visualizing how some of this might play out as you undertake one of the many different types of existing condition studies that you might do. Uh, that's the only example we'll do. I don't have tons of time. I think I'm probably still gonna finish early though. So back to the steps, step five, uh, design an effective public outreach and education strategy. If you recall those images from earlier, the empty room versus the full room, you want the full room in the beginning, not after projects come in and has already gotten controversial. Uh, no way now. <laughs> so again, you wanna make sure you get input from a wide range of diverse stakeholders, uh, Utility representatives might be someone you don't typically think of as getting involved in your community's comprehensive planning and zoning, but in some cases, in particularly for clean energy, it might be helpful to have a utility rep come in. Maybe they can explain some of those lines on the map better than I could. Uh, again, local and regional environmental groups, nonprofits, people that have an interest in this type of thing. 
Uh, I would also add, again, clean energy developers, if you happen to have relationships with any of them or you know about a project they're considering in your town, not that what they say should dictate what you do by any stretch of the imagination, but understanding how they think and how they go about planning for the projects could be good. So uh, that's someone you might not typically think to invite into your planning process that could be interesting to invite in. And of course, you know, again, members of the community, business owners, residents, uh, et cetera. Want to make sure you're able to formulate and write down all of their concerns, issues, problems, uh, perhaps more importantly, their priorities. Um, and any public, effective public outreach and education sessions should include questions and opportunities to get feedback from all of those diverse stakeholders. So not just who has anything to contribute, but like purposely trying to, to tease information from as many different minds as, as you possibly can. So that, you know, a year down the road after the, the comp plan and the zoning and everything is in place, you don't want people coming out of the woodwork then saying, well, you didn't hear what I had to say because there were very clear opportunities uh, to do it. Uh, and then finally, create the clean energy content for your plan. and. I'm going to, we're going to show some examples of what that clean energy content looks like right after we finish uh, just going through the steps to doing it, right? So after you've created all the content, which we'll do in a little bit, then you'll need to complete the legally required process to adopt it. So there might be a referral of the approved plan by your planning board or whatever special board you might create to do this. Uh, to the local legislature, the planning board, county, regional planning authority, et cetera. So lots of folks may be needing to review it. Uh, there's likely public hearings involved to, again, to make sure the public has plenty of opportunities for input. Uh, most likely going to undergo seeker review. I can't imagine many comp plans are going to have an issue going through seeker, but it is required. Uh, agricultural review, uh, potentially. And then good idea to establish terms for periodic review, because if you remember on that, that little flow chart earlier, you don't want it to, to sit on the shelf for 10 plus years and get stale and then have to go through this, this whole thing again the next time you want to uh, revise your zoning or something. And then finally, uh, disseminate it, right? Make sure everyone knows about it, publicize it, and perhaps most importantly of all, uh, implement the plan. All right, so diving into creating the content as promised, uh, the goals and objectives. If you remember from a slide before, we said that the plan should follow um, like a very standardized format, right? So in the, the very top level there was lay out your high level goals and objectives. So all of these should reflect the information that you gathered from the public and whoever else you've invited, all those existing condition studies, whichever ones you choose uh, to undertake that are most important to you, and all of the public engagement. Uh, the goals are going to be longer term, more broadly focused, and the objectives will lay out the intentions that support the goals and are a bit more specifically focused. So um, over on the right hand side, these are just some sample goals and objectives that you might consider for clean energy. All of the examples that I'm gonna give in the coming slides are absolutely not exhaustive. But again, we had so many people ask like, do you have any sample language that we could, could use? So you're more than welcome to copy and paste some of these things or, or edit them as you see fit, create new goals and objectives. But we wanted to just have some concrete examples of what some might look like. So a sample goal here might be support the transition toward clean energy sources. You want your community to support clean energy, very general and broad. Uh, some example objectives that might go under that goal. One objective might be to allow or even incentivize individuals and businesses to use renewable energy and to undertake energy efficiency initiatives. An objective in supporting the transition toward clean energy. A fairly non-controversial objective too. Uh, another objective uh, in supporting the transition toward clean energy sources might be supporting the expansion of clean energy opportunities through the town's land use policies, plans, and regulations. So this is, of course, again, setting you up for 
adopting zoning that's in accordance with the comp plan. Here it's clearly stating that you want to support expansion of clean energy opportunities through your policies, plans, and regulations, right? Um, and then finally, a th another objective that you might have in support of a goal like this is to streamline project review and approval processes so that they are efficient and predictable. And some of these will repeat as we go a little bit uh, deeper into the content. All right, so um, just another example goal with some objectives under it. Let me see if I can zoom in on this one. I always have my back to it. There we go. So another example goal might be balancing clean energy development and continued agricultural operations. I mentioned that earlier. One of the, the biggest concerns that we hear about across the state is solar is going on ag land and we don't wanna use our ag land. So for many communities, that's gonna be super important to, to consider uh, in the comp plan and in your zoning and everything you do. So pretty common goal, I would say there. Uh, some example objectives that a community might include under that goal would be to allow clean energy projects in priority agricultural areas only if mitigation for the agricultural impacts have been identified and addressed. Otherwise, no. Uh, another ob objective in support of that goal of supporting clean energy and continued ag operations might be to encourage solar and other renewable energy production that is compatible with agriculture related businesses. Finally, third objective, again, just trying to give folks lots of examples because we we're asked for it. I don't, hopefully this isn't boring you. Uh, another objective might be prioritizing the balanced siting of clean energy projects on priority farmland that's identified for protection. All right, so continuing with our goals and objectives, there might be, you know, other goals to consider as you're as you're developing the content. You might can look at financial, socioeconomic, other benefits associated with economic development. What kind of employment might certain you know clean energy initiatives create? What kind of tax revenue might you be able to get from some of these projects? Uh, you want to prevent, mitigate, or adapt to the impacts of climate change. Uh, decreasing your use of fossil fuels, diversifying the electric grid for resiliency, for example. Um, and then uh, <laughs> I don't know how many of the municipalities in the state are super excited to adopt this last goal in their comp plans, but maybe you do want to align with New York State goals, policies, and programs on climate and clean energy. So our friends over at Department of State, in collaboration with many other agencies, including NYSERDA, and Department of State, uh, did I say Department of State, DEC, Department of Environmental and Conservation, Department of State, NYSERDA, um, blanking on some of the other partner agencies, but we've all worked together in support of the Climate Smart Communities Program, which has lots and lots of guidance on different actions that communities can take in support of climate action. Um, and it's a certification program. So if you do certain things, your municipality can rack up credits and it's just sort of a nice uh, framework for taking action on the climate. Uh, NYSERDA supports and runs the Clean Energy Communities Program, which kind of follows a similar framework of here's guidance for a whole bunch of different things you can do with respect to clean energy. And if the community does them, you can rack up points and open up the door to grant funding. Sometimes, you do one action in the program and it can be an automatic grant and other times you're, you know, you do multiple things, rack up a certain amount of points and open up a grant that way. So there's a whole bunch of different ways uh, to participate and partner with the state and participate in these programs and, and get grant funding. So while it might have seemed a little bit silly that you want to align with New York State goals, policies and programs with all of the grant funding and the benefits, not just the grant funding, but the benefits that you get from doing those projects, you know, saving money, economic development, et cetera. Uh, perhaps it's not too crazy to think about including that in your planning. All right, so diving deeper, we did high level goals and objectives within those. We're going into strategies now, right? How to actually get through those to achieve those objectives. I need to zoom in a little. I hate having my back to you. 
All right, so you're gonna see the same goal is up here that we looked at on a previous slide, just diving deeper now. So the goal of support the transition toward clean energy sources. Uh, we also already saw the objective that's up here about incentivizing individuals and businesses uh, to do this. One strategy in support of that particular objective might be to offer the real property tax law 487 tax exemption for clean energy systems. Uh, another strategy might be to pursue community choice aggregation. Uh, if you're not familiar with community choice aggregation, it essentially allows a municipality to, by default, aggregate, aggregate all of their residents and small business utility accounts and make their new default electricity provider 100% uh, renewable, for example. So they have that power. And typically, you end up even saving money for your constituents that way, too. Uh, that could that could be a whole presentation in and of itself. I just hate to bring up community choice aggregation without at least giving you a taste of what that means. All right, so on to the next objective of supporting the expansion of clean energy opportunities through the policies in the town. Again, saw that on a previous slide, but one of the strategies we might use to get there would be to amend your local zoning to reflect a balanced approach to clean energy. Uh, you might strategize to utilize and modify as needed. NYSERDA model clean energy laws, which I mentioned earlier. We have a solar zoning law in our solar guidebook. We have an energy storage zoning law in our energy storage guidebook. Again, they're available in word format. We encourage you to edit and customize them as you see fit. Um, hopefully you're not customizing them to the point where you're saying, please don't put any of these types of projects in our town, but you're free to try to do that too. Um, and then finally, another strategy might be to adopt the New York State stretch energy code for your buildings. Uh, the third objective, uh, which again, we saw on an earlier slide of streamlining project review, one of the strategies to achieve that might be to utilize clean energy specific permits and inspection processes. Uh, another might be to digitize your permit applications and fee payments, things like that. So another example, and again, you saw this goal on a previous slide, but we're diving deeper now. Balancing clean energy development and continued agriculture operations. The first objective, allowing clean energy projects in the areas only if they do mitigation. Uh, they've been identified and addressed the mitigation. Uh, one strategy for making sure you achieve that objective would be to amend your local zoning requirements to identify and require adherence to the town's preferred mitigation strategy. So you might reference the New York State Department of Ag and Markets guidelines for solar and agricultural land, for example. Um, they're pretty great. They, they go into pretty specific detail about what you need to do if you're building a solar project on ag land, how to prepare, how to handle the construction activities to protect the soils, make sure it all doesn't get too compacted, and at the end of the project's useful life, when you're decommissioning the system, there, the guidelines go into exactly how to handle all of, all of the soil to make sure it can be returned to its uh, original condition, if not better. Uh, another objective was encouraging solar and other renewable production that's compatible with ag-related businesses. What does that look like? It might be, again, amending your local zoning requirements to encourage the co-location of renewables and agricultural activities. So you might want to write into your zoning like, all right, if you're gonna put solar on ag land, how about you also continue some agricultural operations under and around the solar panels, be it some sort of grazing, uh, maybe planting pollinators and keeping bees to make honey. Uh, we're starting to dabble a little bit more lately into figuring out how to do some more traditional agriculture around solar panels, like actually doing row crops and things like that. I don't know of any examples in New York State yet, but we are hoping to make some examples of that type of co-location agriculture happen in the near future. Uh, it's definitely been done in other parts of the country and uh, the world even. Uh, some, some demonstration projects in other parts of the country here, but they tend to be pretty small, like research demonstration projects. Um, we're hoping to make it more common uh, going forward and prove that it can work. I go on a tangent. All right, so the third objective here, balance, uh, prioritizing balanced siting of clean energy projects. 
on farmland that has been identified for production. What is a strategy to achieve that objective might look like? You might want to identify certain soil categories or phys physical or geographic areas to prioritize, um, considering the historic and current land uses, ensure alignment with local zoning and other land use policies. That's a common theme here, right? Um, and then finally, you might want to amend your local zoning to guide clean energy development to alternative parcels or locations and away from those priority soils, um, which you will know about because of the existing condition studies you've done looking at the looking at the solars and where uh, soils and uh, you know where the grid is and where different uh, zoning exists. And you're going to know where is the solar likely to occur versus where do we want it to occur and where's that sweet spot. Okay, finally, um, if you recall on one of the previous slides, we're like, one of the most important things to do after you've done all this is implement the plan, right? So in order to do that, you need an implementation plan. Uh, this should designate uh, responsibilities, what resources are available to help those who are responsible for it, and clarify any timelines that are associated with those goals, objectives, and strategies. Um, th this could also be a useful tool for evaluating the feasibility of certain objectives and strategies. You might think all of this is such a great idea, and then, oh, once you dig into it, the timeline is going to be eight years or something. Maybe maybe that's not such a high priority. Uh, you get the idea. And so it can also serve as a roadmap to make sure your comp plan components are completed and not forgotten. You know, the old don't let it sit and get dusty on a shelf routine. So uh, a few more examples, and then I will be wrapping up with, I believe, plenty of time, it looks like, for questions. So that's good. This is a little small. I don't know if the folks in the room can see it, but here's an example of what a super simple implementation plan for one of the goals might look like. So the goal, again, this will be familiar by now, support the transition toward clean energy sources. Again, just an example. You can totally make up your own. The objective, streamline the project review and approval process so that it's efficient and predictable. Again, you've heard that before. One strategy to achieve that objective might be to adopt the state's unified solar permit, which is basically just a streamlined permit for smaller solar systems, typically like residential size, maybe small commercial, don't need a ton of review, they're straightforward. Adopt the unified solar permit could be a strategy. Who's responsible for doing that? Maybe the town board in collaboration with the building in inspector. What are some resources that you can use to help achieve that strategy? Uh, NYSERDA has a unified solar permit toolkit, and you can also get technical assistance from NYSERDA's Clean Energy Communities Program. Uh, Tara left the room, but she was here. Looks like she'll be coming back. Um, and also from the siting team, my group, right? We can help you figure out how to adopt this and if it makes sense for you and explain it, et cetera. And then pop in a time period. I would think this one might be something that's more along the lines of two to three months, depending on how often you might have board meetings, for example, but otherwise relatively straightforward. So maybe this goal pops up to the top of the priority list because it's effective and simple to do. Just one example. And then one more slide with a, a whole slew of other detailed examples. And then we're just gonna get into resources after this. Uh, so another example goal, promote clean energy technologies in your municipalities, services, and facilities. An objective in support of that potential goal might be to maximize opportunities for municipal buildings and schools to use renewable energy resources. A strategy for doing that, uh, one strategy anyway, might be to adopt a benchmarking policy for municipal facilities. Uh, it would be tough to maximize the opportunities for those facilities to use renewable energy sources if you don't know how much energy they are already currently using or if they're already efficient. So benchmarking those municipal facilities to sort of set a baseline for where you're at uh, is a good strategy. I'm sure there would be more strategies under that objective, but it's one example. A responsible party for adopting a benchmarking policy for municipal facilities might be your municipal legislature or just some of your staff that you have in-house. Resources for something like that would include 
Again, technical and program assistance from NYSERDA's Clean Energy Communities Program. One of the high impact actions in the Clean Energy Communities Program is benchmarking your municipal buildings. So they're totally available to help walk you through how to do that. Uh, and then again, assign a time period to it so you can help prioritize. Another example goal, support financial strategies that further clean energy development and decrease the cost of electricity. An objective in support of that goal might be to support residential and commercial clean energy projects through regulation and taxation policies. A one of the many strategies that could go along with that objective is ensuring the real property tax law 487 tax exemption remains in place. So by default across the state, if you're not familiar with this, real property tax law 487 by default uh, allows renewable energy projects to ride property tax free. Uh, but the, the taxing jurisdiction does have the ability to say, okay, you're tax free, but we're gonna require a payment in lieu of taxes. And so you can still generate revenue from the projects without them having a full tax burden. Uh, but communities also, taxing jurisdictions rather, have the ability to opt out of real property tax law 487 and just say, we don't want to give the exemption, we don't want to negotiate pilots, we're just going to fully tax these projects. We always recommend not doing that uh, because some projects would not be able to afford full taxation and it's, it's an all or nothing opt out. So if your community opts out of 487 and decides to fully tax renewable energy projects, you're not just fully taxing the large ones that are like utility scale or whatever out, you know, out in a field somewhere, you're also going to be fully taxing solar panels on Joe or Jane homeowners roof, right? And you don't necessarily want to make things more expensive. So what you can do is remain opted in <laughs> to real property tax law 487 and just require payment in lieu of taxes for the for those larger utility scale projects so that we make sure all right, getting revenue from the big projects where needed while not making things too difficult for homeowners, right? Uh, always happy to have conversations about that though. Anyway, that's one strategy for achieving that objective. Responsible party might be your legislature and you'd certainly want your municipal assessor involved as well. Uh, resources to help with that include our solar guidebook for like local governments. You saw an image of that on one of the slides earlier. And also New York State Department of Tax and Finance has resources available as well. Again, assign a time period. Um, this, this particular line here has gotten more complicated even since we created these slides. I was talking earlier about the standardized tax assessment methodology that we've been working on with tax and finance. Again, some litigation going on with it right now. Uh, but what that did was if taxing jurisdictions had opted out of real property tax law 487 and decided to fully tax projects that if it ends up being a thing after the litigation is solved, set a standardized methodology for how those large scale projects, one megawatt and larger would be assessed for property taxes. Sorry, I keep using these as uh, little opportunities to go on tangents here, but I can't help it. All right, on to the last goal, uh, example goal anyway. Uh, it might be increased increase clean energy related employment, business development and training opportunities in your community. An objective of that might be to encourage the development of education and training programs for clean energy employment opportunities. A strategy to do that might be to partner with local clean energy businesses to create paid internships and training opportunities. Responsible party, again, municipal staff, maybe some local businesses should be involved as well. And resources there might be your local and regional planning agencies. Uh, NYSERDA also has a clean energy internship program, not just that we hire our own interns in-house, but our workforce development team has essentially grants that municipalities can apply to to help them fund an intern to do clean energy related work. So that's great. Lots of resources for doing many of these things. Um, speaking of resources, I'm not going to read through all of these slides. It's more for if you get a copy after, you can visit these. Uh, this is probably the fourth time I've plugged our friends at Department of State, uh, Division of Local Government Services. 
They have the zoning and the comprehensive plan, um, et cetera. We've talked about those before. Um, Syracuse University has a New York State comprehensive plan development uh, guidance document. Um, again, NYSERDA has our solar guidebook, our energy storage guidebook, among other things. American Planning Association has some great resources. The New York State Climate Smart Communities Program that I mentioned earlier uh, also has a comprehensive plan resource that talks about how to incorporate sustainability elements that would be uh, broader than just clean energy. And lots of funding and technical assistance available as well. This is not comprehensive or exhaustive, but just examples of things. Local county and regional planning agencies will often have support available, possibly uh, even financing. Uh, New York State consolidated funding application will often have resources. I mentioned before that in the past, at least, Department of State has had comprehensive planning grants included in that CFA process before. Climate Smart Communities has grants. Um, I don't know how I missed getting clean energy community grants in here, but uh, they might be another potential avenue. I don't think the clean energy communities grants through NYSERDA would typically be appropriate for comprehensive planning, but it's worth exploring anyway as a potential option. Uh, New York State Department of Ag and Markets has farmland protection planning grants available. Again, I don't know the timeline on all of these, but it's things that have at least been available in the past and are likely to be available again in the future, if not currently. And again, New York State Department of State, Smart Growth Comprehensive Planning Grant Program. Um, and they also have a lo local government efficiency program. And I believe that's where they're encouraging municipalities to work with one another to essentially save money by sharing uh, services. Okay, so that is all I had. I'm happy to take Q&A. And while I do that, I'll just leave our team's uh, inbox on here clean energy help at nyserta.ny.gov. If you can't find our resources, you have a question, you want to talk to one of us, you want to you know, request a training, clean energy help at nyserta.ny.gov. It will blast off your email to every person on our clean energy citing team. Few folks in the New York Sun program get those emails, I think too, uh, but essentially you're, you'll get someone faster this way than if Maybe you just email me and I have a backlog and I might not see it for a week or so. It's actually a better option to send it to Clean Energy Help. I will see it and everyone else will see it. It's not a black box. Um, so use it. You're also welcome to call, uh, but the email, the email inbox is typically a good place to start. Even if you want to set up a call, we can do it through there. All right. I'm hoping that folks have a few questions or comments. Again, we're not total experts in all of the nitty gritty details. So welcome your experience anecdotes. Yeah. Community choice aggregation. Yep. I'm not, I'm not sure what the stat, and I remember like the capital region trying to put one together. Tara, you might have better insight into this than I do. I don't know exactly what happened or what delayed it, uh, et cetera. Want me to give you the mic so the folks on Zoom can hear you too? Um, yeah, so uh, the you're right. There was one that was getting started. Basically what happened with COVID is the energy markets went a little, crazy and the prices were really high and i think that's why communities decided to not go out to bid there's kind of a group of like 13 municipalities in the capital region that decided to kind of band together and do an aggregation and it just um financially didn't make sense in the end so i think that's where they're at they're looking at some other models um there's a group called capital district community energy that's kind of um taking a lead in that kind of process of working with whoever the you know administrator ends up being for the capital region. It is working out successfully in other areas of the state. Um, the Hudson Valley has one that it just resigned. Westchester County just resigned. So um, prices are kind of stabilizing a bit. And I think communities are kind of deciding to that it 
that it's okay to kind of go forward with this and that it does make sense. So I'm hoping we can renew the effort in the capital region. It's good to hear Waterleet still interested in hearing what's going on. Um, and just I'll, I'll plug myself. I think I know a lot of you. <laughs> Jen mentioned our resources a few times. Um, so we're the Capital District Regional Planning Commission. We um, are the free technical local resource for, for municipalities for the clean energy communities and the climate smart communities program. So uh, NYSERDA and the DEC basically pay us to be available to communities for anything related to any of this stuff. We can help you navigate all those resources that Jen mentioned, which can be a little confusing um, if you don't have a planning office. Um, even if you do, it can be confusing. So do not hesitate to use, use us as a resource um, for any of this stuff. So. Uh, any other questions? Do we have any hands raised or something on Zoom? Something in the chats? Easy, easy crowd this morning. Okay. Going once, going twice. Pat, do you want to say anything else before we go or are we just breaking for lunch early? 10 minutes early. Yeah, I just uh, thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. Uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, for coming out. If you're sticking around for the second training, um, it begins at 1230. But other than that, I just want to uh, thank Jen, thank NYSERDA. Uh, we're really excited about a lot of the, you know, uh, sustainability and climate change initiatives that we're working on here in the county. Um, so we love to work with the different municipalities as much as we can collaborate and hopefully just create stronger communities going forward. So uh, once again, the second training is at 1230 for the peeps, for the folks on Zoom. Uh, we've sent out a link for that as well. Um, so once again, thank you, Jen, and uh, appreciate you all coming out.